We're very excited to have at this last hour of the afternoon Brother J.D. Conley, who comes to us from down in Marietta. Uh, J.D. was born in El Paso, Texas in 1959. He's a third generation gospel preacher. Uh, He is in his 25th year of full-time preaching. He has preached uh, in La Rose, Louisiana, and his first sermon was there at the age of 15. He majored in Bible at Freed Hardman University, and he is also a graduate of the Brown School School of Preaching, Brown Trail School of Preaching in Fort Worth, Texas. He's been in three located works in Spencer, West Virginia, Elkins, West Virginia, and then currently at Harmer Hill Church of Christ in Marietta, Ohio, where he's in his 14th year of working there, and he's also one of the elders. He's married or has been married to the former Denise Cooper for 38 years. They have six children, five grandchildren. His oldest son, Shane, is also a graduate of the West Virginia School of Preaching, and he is preaching at the Land Between the Lakes Church of Christ down in Dover, Tennessee. We're excited to have him here, and we look forward to your message, Brother J.D. Thank you, brother, for those kind words, and thank you for being so accommodative of my infirmity. I'm glad that I can be here this afternoon, and I always regard it a great privilege and honor to speak on this great lectureship. I believe it's one of the very best that our brotherhood has to offer, and I want you to know how grateful I am to the elders, to Andy, and the Lectureship Committee for the invitation to be with you today. The Church of Our Lord is in a chokehold. It's in a chokehold of apathy. And that apathy has affected our worship, and it most effectively has affected our work. What can be done to rectify this problem. Somehow, and in some way, we've got to find a way to reignite a hungry spirit. And one thing we can do to jumpstart our spiritual appetite is to infuse the prodigious book of Psalms into our daily diet. Because Psalms is a book that cannot but help enhance and enrich our spiritual life. And therefore, I commend the selection of this year's theme, as well as the topic for my assignment, with a hungry spirit taken from Psalm 42. Now, if there's one thing that brethren like to do, love to do, it's eat. And it seems if we are not eating, we are talking about eating. And because of our affluent American lifestyle, eating is easy, it's plentiful, it's relatively inexpensive, and it's constant. Our prandial appetites are quickly satisfied in any number of ways, whether it be at the kitchen table, the vending machine, drive throughs or my favorite, pizza delivery. If for some reason we miss a meal, oh, that's a fate worse than death. We feign famishment and echo Esau's sentiment, behold, I'm at the point to die. But what we call hunger, that's only a mild irritation of an empty stomach that has missed its scheduled refill. But a real gnawing physical hunger that many in the world live with on a daily basis is completely foreign to us. Wouldn't it be grand if Christians could feel spiritual hunger as sharply as they do physical? To sustain a hungry spirit, that ought to be our aim instead of allowing it to be suppressed by an appetite for apathy. Christians should make sure that their hunger 
for spiritual things remain as acute as their appetite for physical things. To aid us in reaching that goal, let's turn our attention now to the 42nd Psalm, wherein is set forth a hungry spirit that makes worship enrichment possible. And Psalm 42 does a fine job of setting the table as we pull up the proverbial chair. As we do that, we hear hunger proclaimed in verses 1 through 4. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my spirit in me. For I, I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. Who is making this dire proclamation of hunger? And why is he making it? Now in the book I've given reasons why I believe it's not the sons of Korah and why I lean toward David being the author, so without taking the time, I'll let you read that later. But regardless of the writer's identity, why is he proclaiming this fierce hunger? If the writer is David, I believe he is doing so because he has been debarred from public worship with God's people which would have been the unhappy consequence of being driven out of Jerusalem by his rebellious son, Absalom. What do you suppose it would take for a brother or sister in Christ today to feel this same sense of spiritual hunger? Would our spiritual liberties have to be stripped from us? Would it take the chaining, the doors on our building to do it? Would our Bibles have to be confiscated and burned before we'd feel a palpable sense of loss? Think about it. Just what would it take before we'd shout out the same sentiments as the psalmist and mean them? What extreme measures would have to be enacted to have our worship enriched again? What injustices would have to be enforced to get us to partner after God or to pant after God and have our hungry spirit renewed? Does something so precious as worship have to be yanked away before we properly appreciate it. May we cherish the teachings of Psalm 29 2 and give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the spirit or in the beauty of holiness. Notice that the writer begins his proclamation of hunger by verbalizing the need expressed in verses 1 and 2. The pressing need is for his spiritual thirst to be slaked. And what a vivid metaphor the writer evokes. Just as an exhausted deer pants for streams of water, the man with a hungry spirit pants after God himself. What the water brooks were to the heart's life, God is to the human heart. Even though water is life-giving sustenance, it provides nothing for soul survival. Only God can meet the needs and longings of the soul. It's obvious that this man desperately needed God. His incessant panting and thirsting after him proved it. He invokes God's name four times in two verses. 
13 times in this psalm of 11 verses, God is mentioned. 12 of these 13 times, the name God is translated from Elohim, which is the Hebrew plural denoting the Godhead. And so the heavy use of Elohim should underscore how much the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are needed for the satisfaction of our souls. Note that the scribe continues to portray his hungry spirit as thirsting for the living God. The God that Brother A.W. Dicus wrote about. In the grand hymn, our God, He is alive, who is depicted in the soaring lyrics, in Him we live and we survive. Now some see a redundancy in the words live and survive, but perhaps there's a nuance to be appreciated. No doubt the psalmist drew a distinction between living and surviving. In fact, he was starving and thirsting for God. Yes, he was living, but all the while he was striving for spiritual survival too. <coughs> Many have lived a Christian life, but they've stopped. Oh, they continue to live physically. They might even attend all the services, but that is the sum total of their Christianity. They've died spiritually going cold blue in the pew and need to be immediately resuscitated. May God help us to see our absolute dependency upon Him. One way in which God seeks to satiate our spiritual hunger is by allowing us to approach Him in worship. The question, when shall I come and appear before God, that seems to be a plaintive expression issuing from a heart longing to be reunited with God in public worship. It was a separation likened to extreme thirst. It was nothing less than an intense craving for spiritual satisfaction. What about us? How does our spiritual longings compare? Do absences from worshiping with our brethren produce the types of hunger pains the psalmist felt? Or do we dread having to get out of bed on Sunday morning or out of an easy chair on Sunday evening or Wednesday evening to go worship God and to study His Word? How many Christians can truthfully claim, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord? Psalm 122 verse 1. Because my soul thirsteth after God. For the living God. Next we have the nausea expressed in verses 3 and 4. Now depending on the circumstances, possessing a hungry spirit can be unpleasant. And since a condition such as spiritual hunger exists, so does spiritual nausea. And this queasy condition prevails as evident in the words, tears... Day and night, verse 3, and in the phrase, I pour out my soul in me, verse 4. Clearly, the writer of the psalm is spiritually upset. And instead of eating, he wept. His separation from God had robbed him of his physical appetite for food. This bout of spiritual nausea had no period of respite. It went on day and night. It remained with him constantly without intermission. And to intensify the nausea, his enemies were bitterly taunting him, asking, Where is thy God? Verse 3. As believers, what uglier question could be asked? 
Just because adversity makes its inevitable appearance, why does that give license for unbelievers to jab us with this vicious barb? Make no mistake, the psalmist felt the pain of this question inflicted. That's why it was asked, not once, but continually. Verse 3, he goes on to say, When I remember these things, verse 4, that is the sickening sorrows of being separated from the house of God and the mistreatment of my enemies. And he's not so much speaking of his present condition. Rather, he is saying he will never forget how he felt during this period of his life. Because the verb remember is in the future tense. And the phrase could be rendered, I will remember these things and I will pour out my soul within me. Therefore, he is determining to never forget this period of spiritual nausea when his hungry spirit was at its most starved point. For the rest of his life, he desired to always remember this time of trial and his dire need for God. Now, if David did pen these words, then maybe that sheds some light on these words that I believe he wrote in Psalm 119. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Verse 71. Such a vivid memory of this forlorn occasion would serve to enrich his worship. With a hungry spirit, he would once again worship God with a renewed voice of joy and praise with a multitude of fellow worshipers, as the end of verse 4 declares. Now we proceed from hunger proclaimed to hunger pains in verses 5 through 7. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and from the Hermonites, from the hill Mizar, deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. In verses 5 and 6, we have nourishment desired. When we feel hunger pains, the first thing we want to do is go find something to eat and stamp them out. And likewise, the psalmist is doing the same thing here with his spiritual hunger pains. He is doing so by engaging in a healthy dose of self-admonishment. He is inquiring as to why he is disquieted. Verse 5, that is, why is he worried? Why is he fretful? Why is he so upset? And it seems to dawn on him that such is completely unnecessary because after all, God is there regardless of the efforts of those trying to tell him he's not. So he preaches a short but powerful sermon to himself saying in verse 5, Hope thou in God. In fact, he preaches this sermon again down in verse 11. But in order to have hope in God, we must first have faith. Our worship cannot ever be enriched apart from a firm hope and resolute faith in God. Even when we are tempted to feel slighted or forgotten by Him, or feel that He is deaf to our petitions, blind to our service, unmoved by our worship, our past experiences inform us God has not abandoned us. It's because He is all good, all powerful, all knowing, and all present. We can be assured that He still loves us and cares for us. Look at what He writes at the end of verse 5. For I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. God will, and He is the only one who can, provide spiritual nourishment. Though His hunger pains have eased up, 
the inspired penman is still in the throes of spiritual want. He returns to his lament, but now appears to be more tranquil. This time, his complaint is prefaced with, Oh my God, verse 6, meaning he has shifted from talking to himself in verse 5 to addressing Elohim. He tells God, my soul is cast down within me. The fact that he confesses this to God shows he has begun a spiritual recovery. He's still down, but he's headed up. His grief has dulled and his despair has diminished. He is struggling as best he can to hope in God. And to assist him in this effort, he takes a trip down memory lane. In doing so, he provides for us his geographical location. He maps out from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill of Mizar. We know from these names that he is depicting the land of Judea. Now, we might assume that the Hermonites were a people. To the contrary, the Hermonites was a mountain range comprised of three summits rising east of the Jordan River. And the last landmark mentioned is the hill of Mizar. A marginal reading has the little hill. This may be a reference to Zion, which in comparison to the mountains of Hermon would appear little. The area the writer describes would be where David fled from Absalom. In verse 7, we see nutrients depleted. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. This language demonstrates spiritual hunger pangs were still nibbling away at the heart of the psalmist. He feels as though all spiritual nutrients have been flushed away, leaving him drained of any hope for renewal, much less enrichment. Water spouts is more clearly rendered waterfalls in other versions, meaning the writer feels pounded with one unrelenting torrent of affliction after another. It's as though his emaciated soul is submerged in a roiling current of troubles. And as a good man, he could not understand his situation. How strange, if not wrong, to be confronted with this spiritual struggle. Had God made him a castaway? Does he make us castaways? No. Christ has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Peter has warned us, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. So why do we ask, where is God when hardships come? Why do we impugn His care when the way gets rough? These couple of verses alone make asking such a question inexcusable. God has never promised us Elysian fields here on this earth. To the contrary, He said, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We should have the attitude of James, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Having this kind of mindset and determination will prevent the depletion of spiritual nutrients and will infuse us with the strength to forge ahead. Hard times will come. Hard times may have arrived, but it's comforting to know God is here to guide us through the storm. We progress from hunger pains to hunger postponed, verse 8. Yet the Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night His song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. The acute hunger pains have been put on hold, and the weary psalmist enjoys an interval of peace. This is made possible, how? By the unwavering mercy of God. 
His mercy is shown day and night. The psalmist in Psalm 136 is emphatic about that. In every verse, it endureth forever. The prophet exclaims, He delighteth in mercy. Micah 7 and verse 18. So we see in this verse, provender detected. God's mercy is what made this postponement of hunger possible. Spiritual sustenance was lovingly provided for this ravished individual. Jeremiah attested to God's mercy when he wrote, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in Him. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. When we read the Psalms with a hungry spirit, we are assured God will satisfy us when we need it most. Because His compassions fail not. Even though we might go through spells of discouragement, God will always come to our aid day or night. And although hunger is postponed, we see next hunger's persistence, verses 9 through the first part of verse 11. I will say unto God my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Just as physical hunger is a persistent reoccurrence, so is spiritual hunger. Sometimes spiritual hunger morphs into spiritual dissatisfaction. It appears as though the psalmist has digressed somewhat to his former state of mind from verses 5 and 6. But it seems to be that he's striving to keep his digression in check by declaring, I will say unto God, my rock. It sounds as though he is confessing God is his strength, God is his support, God is his fortress. But others see this as an indictment, depicting God as a steep cliff, high above swirling waters, a slippery cliff, a rock that can be stood upon but slipped from too. If this is what the Holy Spirit implies, and what I mean by this is, if this is what the psalmist's attitude toward God is, not that God is a slippery rock, because He's not. Rather, if this is what the psalmist is erroneously thinking, then we note the return of the writer's gnawing affliction in verse 9. The affliction is embedded in the question posed, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Now he's back on the same old sheet of music, repeating the same sorry sentiment, God has not forgotten him. An omniscient God is incapable of forgetting anyone, even though we often forget him. Whenever we as God's people get it in our heads that God has forgotten us, we are the ones who have forgotten God, at least the kind of God he is. No greater affliction can be suffered than a child of God thinking God has forgotten him or has turned his back on them, has abandoned them. That's a sure recipe for mourning, and it robs us of any desire to worship God. May we recognize that such a gnawing affliction can easily change into a growling agitation. Consider the first part of verse 10. As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me. Our enemies have always been an agitation that moves us to growl in grief. Their taunts and insults are the acid test of our faith. But we can overcome. We can persevere. 
When we are agitated by our enemies, let's look to Jesus as our example of how to cope with persecution, focus our gaze upon that great cloud of witnesses cheering us on, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4, instead of allowing circumstances to agitate us, may they serve to draw us closer to God so our worship will be enriched instead of eliminated. Should our enemies thrust a sword into our bones, may it not deter us from serving God our rock. Question. Do we detect, next from the last part of verse 10 to the beginning of verse 11, a growing agnosticism? While they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? We've got to admit that our enemies excel at planting seeds of doubt about God's existence. Not that those seeds always germinate, but they nonetheless are expertly sown. Oh, that we had the same flair for sowing the seed of the kingdom. The question is, were these enemies making any headway with the psalmist and undermining his faith in the Almighty? Was his theism spiraling into agnosticism? The repetition of their mean-spirited question, where is your God, certainly carried the potential for reflection on that question. Since he was compelled to hear this cruel query every day, did it start to have its intended effect? Thankfully, closer examination seems to discount this because the next two questions are his own. By posing these questions, he seems to be scolding himself. Evidently, his silent answer to the sneering question, where is thy God, is he's everywhere. And since God is omnipresent, he then questions his fretful condition. Why am I down and out? You know, what need is there for me to worry? More importantly, why should we ever harbor this sort of disposition? Even though we live in a time of militant atheism and visceral hatred for sacred things, we must not find ourselves in a similar state. The masses may reject God, but the resolve of the faithful few must endure. And this marvelous psalm concludes with hunger pacified. Verse 11 ends with the self-exhortation, Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. This is nearly a word-perfect duplicate of verse 5. Happily, the psalmist sees his soul revived. He is anticipating a joyful return to the public worship of God. And he will do so for the help of his countenance. That phrase, his countenance, does not refer to God's face, but his favor. God's favor was his support and the satisfaction the psalmist gained by it. Because of this, worshiping God was desired. The penman now sees God as his friend and deliverer. The revival of his soul is seen in the repeated phrase of verse 5, Hope thou in God. The writer of Hebrews affirms, Which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Hebrews 6.19 Apart from God, there is no hope, there is no anchor of the soul, and we are adrift in the sea of despair. But because this person has hope in God... His soul is revived. Each Lord's Day and every time the doors of our meeting houses are opened, we ought to eagerly assemble to offer heartfelt worship to God. Can we say with this joy-filled psalmist, for I shall yet praise Him? 
If so, then with a hungry spirit, our worship will be enriched each time we come together. And we will look forward to coming and appearing before God. And gratefully, this psalm ends with the writer's strength restored. He claims Elohim to be his personal God. He affirms him as my God. Twice in derision, he was asked, where is thy God? The purpose for those questions was to erode his faith, ultimately destroying it entirely. In the end, the ploy failed. Thy God became my God. His strength was restored. May we realize that when God becomes our God, that our worship reaches the highest level of enrichment. And unless that takes place, our worship, as well as our work, will forever be lacking. Any Christian who remains lukewarm and apathetic, refusing to cultivate and maintain a hungry spirit, will always be nauseating to the Lord, and unless repentance takes place, he or she will be spewed out of his mouth. So instead of our prayers being punctuated with the complaints of why, where, and when, let them be filled with desire, hope, and gratitude for what our God has done for us. Because only then can our worship be enriched and our spirit remain hungry. This afternoon, can you say that your spirit is hungry? That you desire to come before God? That you look forward to worshiping Him each Lord's Day, each Wednesday night, every time the doors are open in spirit and in truth? Have you lived as a Christian ought to live? If not, take this opportunity to repent of that. Repent of your apathy and become engaged once again heavily in the work of the Lord. If you're here this afternoon and you're not a Christian, let me encourage you to believe on Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Act on that faith. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him to be God's Son. And be baptized into His name for the forgiveness of your sins. Whatever your need might be, please come and make it known as we stand and as we sing. Ah.